Hey guys, John here, and your eyes do not deceive you. It is a new episode of Lather Talk. Before we get into today's episode, a few items for housekeeping. First off, I want to apologize for the earlier than expected podcast break. Unfortunately, I misjudged the amount of free time I had on my hands once my kids got out of school and our travel started. So the good news is we have some episodes in the wings um, and you will see come out in the following weeks. Uh, to tease it a little bit, we have YouTuber HD Shaves as well as some additional listener spotlights uh, coming at you. So keep an eye out for those. Secondly, this is something that no one else might care about except me, but I decided to change the numbering system for the podcast episodes. So basically I've dropped the seasons and that never really adhered to anything too closely. So I figured why keep it around, just have the overall episode number. So today's happens to be episode 53 and it's kind of a cool way to see how far we've come since episode one, three or four years ago. Also, I want to welcome the newest patron to our Lather Talk Patreon, Franklin H. Alden. Thank you so much for your support, Franklin. If you'd like to help the podcast financially, go check out our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash lathertalk. Of course, our main episodes are always free, but patrons will have early access to bonus content and other goodies. And lastly, to preview what's coming up on today's episode, Gerard and I are talking to Ben Esposito of House of Mammoth. We had the pleasure of collaborating with Ben on this upcoming release called Voices. It's a project that's been months in the making. So keep on listening to learn more about The Scent, about how we came up with the name Voices, as well as the organization that we'll be donating a portion of the proceeds to Stop AAPI Hate. All right, so without further delay, let's move on to the main episode. Hey listeners, welcome back to a new episode of Lather Talk. We are so glad to be back. We're so glad to have you join us because today we are talking about our upcoming software release titled Voices. And with me is Gerard, my co-host. Hey, Gerard. Hey, what's going on, everyone? And the artisan that you may have heard uh, that we went with uh, over on social media, we've announced this. But for podcast-only listeners, guys, Voices is being brought to you uh, by the very talented Mr. Ben Esposito of House of Mammoth. Ben, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're a podcast-only listener, you missed the rabbit ears behind my head. That my wife threw up. Just <laughs> so there's a little plug to go check out the video version. Um, the uh, Mrs. House of Mammoth is also <laughs> on the line to to keep us in, to keep the boys in check. I, I guess. <laughs> Mammoth that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. If she's keeping us in check. In fact, I think she's probably going to be going the opposite direction. <laughs> Okay. Hey, I'll that that's that's totally fine. That's totally fine. But um, to to kick things off, I, I guess a little bit background first. I'm still a little loopy. I'm a little bit jet lagged. So apologies if this comes out a little uh, piecemeal. But uh, voices is the first uh, you know soap. I keep wanting to call it a soap, but it, it's uh, a scent. Really, it's a scent that's coming out in shave soap after shave. Uh, splash aftershave bomb and a fragrance uh and also we'll get into this maybe a little bit later but there are also some brushes uh that are uh, coming out too associated uh not sure exactly the the timing of everything but either way there's some brushes too so this idea of voices came about uh I guess we wanted to not just do another soap with the Lather Talk name on it. Uh, There's nothing wrong with a a good old, you know, vanity project just to kind of put your stamp, um, you know, leave your mark on a a hobby that you love. Nothing you really no no shade is being thrown. But uh, I know I would I definitely wanted to take the opportunity to bring light to a subject 
and a subject that both Gerard and I would care about. And in this case, uh, I knew early on who I wanted a portion of the proceeds to go to for this release, and that is Stop AAPI Hate. Uh, That acronym is for Asian American Pacific Islander. And it's an organization that... uh, I guess we'll have to get more into this in just a little bit because uh, I think I wanted to be able to share, you know, part of my story. I want uh, the guest today and <laughs> also want Gerard and Ben to share their stories uh, dealing with this. But whether you know it or not, you know, during the pan- pandemic, especially things were hard for the Asian American community. Uh, I know we, we and in general, uh, this idea of Asian American identity uh, it's kind of this deeper thing that goes beyond shaving, and I somehow want to incorporate it uh, with this release as well. So there's a lot going on, but first, the very concrete things. Uh, and, and Ben, I want I want to uh, hear from you. I want the listeners to hear from you a bit about uh, the, the scent creation and kind of where we went from that. Just um, as much as you, as you want to share, like uh, the broad strokes of how basically you made a custom scent for us yeah definitely so um first i wanted to say thank you guys for for thinking of me you know to collaborate with it's always really an honor i think to be able to work on projects with other people and you know i've done a lot of collaborations mainly because i really enjoy those relationships and i think um have a good time with it you know i I have a lot of ideas of stuff that i can do for my own um brand, but when you can collaborate with other people, suddenly it sort of expands the whole thing and makes it bigger than just um, one person. So I know uh, when we first started talking, we were talking a lot about, um, you know, what would the scent be? And someone came up with the idea of mango, like right off the bat. I don't, do you remember who, who came up with the idea of mango? I I think it was John. It was? Okay. Yeah, just, um, and mango being a fruit that has kind of significance in both uh, Taiwanese culture, which is my background, and Filipino culture, which is Gerard's. So I, I kind of like that that overlap. And then I don't, I'm like, we could always use more mango scents, <laughs> I feel like. Definitely. Yeah, as far as I know, there's really just the one that's that's um, Tudo Mango by Katie's Bubbles. Um, I know there's been yeah. other ones, but none of them are really springing to mind at the moment. At least none that feature that, you know, sort of prominently. But yeah, and so mango is an interesting one because there's such a wide range of different types of mangoes and the flavor and scent is it, it really, really different across varieties and even different types of ripeness. Um, uh, I've traveled a little bit in, in Southeast Asia, and so one of the things that you find there is not just ripe mangoes like we eat in the States, um, but also even unripe mangoes. And so there's, an, there's kind of like a crisp, like a green apple texture to that, and then you can eat eat it with um, a mixture of salt and sugar and uh, yeah shrimp paste and sugar um, all sorts of different things and so it can really take on a lot of different um, you know varieties so it was it was interesting just thinking okay well what kind of mango even you know what sort of a scent is this going to be just a sweet straightforward sugary you know type mango Um, or is it going to take on a different identity Um, so it's interesting you know I think a lot of times you think from the standpoint of perfumery, let's just get, you know, some essential oil from a, a plant and put that into a fragrance or a soap, and then you're done. Um, mango in particular, you really can't extract any kind of oils or fragrant materials from it. So this is a scent or a note that you had to basically completely create from scratch. Um, mm. So I had to do quite a bit of research and, and experimentation and try to figure out uh, different aroma, uh, aroma chemicals and various materials that would approximate or at least, you know, trick your brain into thinking that it's smelling uh, a mango. Do you guys have any, mm-hmm. like, what, what types of mangoes do you like the best? So, oh, you want to go? No, go All ahead, right. go ahead. Um, yeah, um, you'd mentioned, like, like being Filipino, uh, um, unripened mangoes are very, very popular uh, with shrimp paste or bagoong, which is the, the native um word for shrimp paste in, in Tagalog uh, for most Filipinos. But also those, um, uh, like, I personally enjoy the, known as, like, champagne mangoes or, like, manila mangoes, you know, things like that. 
Um, dep it probably depends on like, you know, like which, which store you get it, who they want to market to, but they're the smaller ones. Um, also being in Southern California, like, you know, we also have a quite the large um, Latino community. And so Mexican mangoes are, are very plentiful as well. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, those are, those are like the most common ones that like, that I've experienced and, and they're just, uh, you know, we'll kind of, I know we're going to kind of get to the, the, the essence of, you know, of voices, um, probably like maybe leave that to you guys as well, but, um, it just goes to show kind of how versatile and, you know, um, widespread it, it, you know, it is in, in cuisine, um, for many cultures. Yeah. I, I, um, besides kind of what kind of mango that's, it's, it's similar, like Mex Mexican mango being the most, uh, readily available as far as like a specific kind of Taiwanese thing, uh, it, what immediately comes to mind is mango shave ice. Yum. And that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so for those, like, if you know, you know, but if you don't know, it's uh, really finely, sh it's, it's not the, uh, what's that thing from like the ice cream truck you get? Snow cone. That, snow cone. So if you're thinking it's like this rock hard thing, that is not Taiwanese shave ice. It is super fine, almost like a snow. And then you, you put, like super ripe chunks of bright orange mango and then condensed milk. I mean, you can kind of stop there. Uh, but I feel like, like that, that, com that combo, it's, it, it's very refreshing. It sounds really good right now because it's like almost a hundred degrees and humid <laughs> where Ben and I are. Oh, it would be amazing uh, right now. That's and je sure. That'd be so jelly. It's still oh. 100 degrees where I am. So, like, it's, it's brutal. <laughs> it's a hot There's day, no so. place where it's not brutal yeah. right now where any of us are. That's So anyone on the show right now... Uh, oh, and then Elaine also mentioned lychee jelly, which has this another just another great texture. It's found in a lot of Asian desserts. Uh, a lot of Asian desserts are about... And this, I guess, kind of segues to where we eventually landed, but it's about textures anyway. But, um, yeah, so mango, mango shave ice, and then just, like, uh, dried mango. There's a lot of dried. I think in, in, um, Costco carries like a Filipino brand dried mango, as as far as I remember. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. So it can take on so many different forms. Um, you know, uh, you, you hear my wife Elaine. She's here in the room with me. She's actually from Malaysia, and so when we've been over there, um, having mango shave ice is one of my favorite things too. And so there's a few places over there that have it. Um, a few other places that we've been. Certainly Hawaii. <laughs> Also, yeah, <laughs> yep. they've got it right, right out there on the street. It's amazing. Um, and and this particular uh, fragrance, um, I didn't want to go super, super sweet because I was also thinking about it as, you know, fragrance that somebody could wear, you know, something that you, you would just be able to spray on yourself and enjoy. And um, if you just get super sweet and fruity, you know, that really kind of limits the audience. And I, and I really wanted to be a little bit more creative with it. Um, I got really lucky and, and made a contact with somebody who is a supplier of, of fragrance ingredients and uh, he's out of the UK and he was able to send me over a few materials that have um, kind of like a nutty rice type of a aspect to them and so I've been playing around with them and just was su super curious uh, how they would play with other materials and so um, once I started mixing that with some of my trials for the mango it just really started to explode and it felt really, really good. At um, first, it smelled like that Thai dessert, the Thai sticky rice mango. Mm -hmm. Very sweet. <laughs> yeah. <But> initially, <laughs> it, was, it was much right. more sweet. You know, and, and um, mango sticky rice is really, you know, for most for the most part, is a very sweet type of a dessert, you know, depending on what type of mango you have with it. You know, mangoes themselves can, can be super sweet, like you were saying, or... It can even be a bit more tart or have green notes or even floral notes to them. Um, but then once you make sticky rice and you incorporate coconut milk and even sometimes people will use um, sugar and condensed milk too. And it gets even like the rice itself gets even sweeter. Uh, but sticky rice is interesting too because it's not just, um, it's a very different type of rice. It's, it's a short grain rice and it actually uh, develops kind of like a glutinous texture. Where it sticks together. Um, and so it's really fun to eat and it has a very unique kind of scent to it as well. And so it was really interesting being able to kind of mix things. And Elaine was, was my expert nose on it too. Uh, as she always is, she's kind of like the silent, um, 
you know, scent checker along the way while I'm doing my trials. <laughs> like, hey, what does this smell like to you? And I won't tell her what it is. You know, <laughs> you need to have like you need to have a good blind. Aha! It's feet. Uh-huh. <laughs> Oh, it's a sounding car. board. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it was it was interesting. You know, very early on, she was like, "Oh, that's mango sticky rice, and it's really good." Um, and so from there, it was really just figuring out with, together with you guys, how do we turn this from something that smells dead on like a dessert to just rounding it out a little bit and giving it a bit more of like a, a perfumey, cologne character but still mm-hmm. have it be somewhat reminiscent of, of mango sticky rice. I and think so, I told you if I smell that all day, I'll get really frustrated because I couldn't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You don't want to be walking around and be super edible. Or, or maybe, yeah, maybe you want to be. I don't know. <laughs> hey now. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, so yeah. that really was, was part of it. So I know I sent you guys... Um, a few trials along the way and you know i would do maybe 10 or 12 trials and then send you guys another version and then do a few more and send you guys another one and uh it's interesting because this being the first time that we've worked together on a fragrance like this um from my perspective it's always a little bit nerve-wracking like what are they gonna say and so i'm trying to apologize like it's, it's unfinished you know <laughs> keep in mind this is a work in progress work- um, exactly, work in progress. Yeah, but that's part of it. Is you know you have to be you have to be willing to kind of make big mistakes if you go in one direction and then expand and go back in another direction and correct course. Um, so the final, I'm really happy with it. I think it it really conveys the essence of the mango sticky rice inspiration. Um, it has that fruitiness. It has you know those the mango sort of tropical notes, but then it definitely has the nutty kind of rice aspect to it. It has a bit of coconut, but it's not overwhelming. Um, a bit of kind of even like a green, like a terpenic. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but a bit of like a sharp uh, greenness to it as well. So you kind of get the the skin in there, um, and and then just kind of a nice warm uh, woody base. And I think I think it's really well balanced, and it'll be really fun for people to use and to wear. Yeah, definitely. Just thinking back on like when we started a group chat with the three of us and going through that process, I think it, it was really surprising and pleasantly surprising that I feel like we're already kind of on the same wavelength on a lot of things. Uh, I, I'm gonna say all three of us didn't want it to be too sweet, so that that kind of like the first round of feedback. Uh, I think we're trying to per- to avoid a gourmand type scent, but funny enough, right? To really uh, once that uh, sticky rice note came in more more prominently on like the later to final version, as well as the coconut, I, I, I think we all were like, we gotta go, we, we have to go gourmand, but we can still temper the sweetness. Uh, I, you, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like it wasn't there wasn't any major course corrections, but we just were refining with each round. Yeah, definitely. You know, and I, and I think that that is part of what made it fun, um, because there really are just so many different directions you can go. You know, when you're creating something that's, you know, got so many different notes, <laughs> so many different aspects to it, and so it was really cool to hear what your impressions were. And I know you shared it with your wives and stuff too. So it was cool to have them yeah. loop in, right? <laughs> this was yeah. like uh-huh. wife, 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 and kids. That's cool. And kids Everyone, too. Everyone, yeah, kids too. It's My fun. two-year-old was unimpressed with any of it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> He's also unimpressed with everything in life, so it, uh, uh, there you go. <laughs> he'll get there eventually. Um, but really, I mean, thinking about the idea of being able to collaborate you, with you guys and wanting something that really was high quality, um, you know, it's it's a balance of having fun with it and being willing to sort of play a little bit, but then also thinking in the back of your mind, like, the stakes are kind of high. Like this is kind of like an important project and something that's meaningful to all of us. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it really was great working with you guys because I know that you guys sort of get it. You know, you're like, yeah, let's let's put the work in, even if it takes longer. Let's let's make let's get it right. Let's get it to be something that we can all be really proud of. Um, and I think that ultimately we really come up with something that's really special. Not getting enough drama talking smack or hooligan hijinks from your regular forums, social media, or Reddit? Well, the Lather Talk Discord is not for you. Sorry to disappoint. 
But if you're looking for a cool place to hang out with fellow traditional shaving degenerates, come on down to the Lather Talk Discord. Share your shave of the days, mail calls, or talk about your favorite hardware or software and just about everything in between. Once again, that's Lather Talk Discord. Check out the link below. Uh, you did mention, and, and just so we don't forget, uh, we did have uh, a mutual friend of uh, all three of us uh, help with the design of the label uh, that Ben mentioned. So a quick thank you and shout out to Wise One. Uh, a friend over, he's on the Lather Talk Discord. We know him over on Reddit. Um, he donated his time to work with us and our crazy ideas of, at, at the very least, to mash up the House of Mammoth and Lather Talk logo. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think I think Wise One really killed it. It's it's incredible, and we really um, went back and forth quite a bit on the label, and, and he he created a lot of different versions, and so. Yes. It was nice being able to work with somebody who was able to execute pretty much anything and we were able to really come up with something that I think looked really great. Uh, my favorite part is probably, um, it's a, probably a tie between the speaker texture mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the label yeah, and this waveform underneath the voices. Um, it's a fun little Easter egg. It's actually a waveform of the word voices, voices. Um, that we actually took directly from, I just spoke into a sound recorder mm. and then did a screenshot of the waveform and sent it over to him. And he was able to incorporate that into the label as well. So really just a cool um, mashup of our, of our logos and then a few kind of fun little Easter eggs that really wouldn't have come, I don't think, uh, unless we had this theme of the podcast and voices. Um, I wonder if that might be a good lead in to talk a little bit about why is this called Voices? Uh, in the first place. Yep, totally agree. It's a good, it's a really good segue that you you just set up for us. So uh, this idea of voices, uh, and it, I think it's a name that's broad enough to mean something different for everyone. So while I share, I, I also do want to invite Gerard and Ben to share what this might mean for for them as well. But um, for for me, voices besides the very obvious thing that we are doing a podcast. And, you know, at the heart of it, you're going to listen to the podcast. It just so happens we have a full on video. But, you know, the heart of it, the con of, the, of this content is voices. And I alluded to this earlier uh, about kind of Asian American identity. And in this case, uh, voices speaks to the idea of representation. And that is a very it's a loaded term. And I, that I don't think should be loaded uh, whether politically or otherwise, but representation matters. Uh, I, I, and I don't think you can really argue about that, whether we're talking about uh, different ethnicities being on our TVs and movie screens. Uh, you know, Asian Americans have traditionally been underrepresented, um, uh, underrepresented in TV shows and movies. I, I consume a lot, you know, love my pop culture, and as a teenager, I just remember, like, uh, there's barely, especially amongst males, like, like, there aren't a lot of Asian American males um, besides your Bruce Lee's and Jackie Chan's. And even then, those kind of celebrities were often weaponized against myself, against other people. Uh, and, and so in this age of YouTube, new media, and, and other platforms coming up, podcast included, there's a way that we have been given a voice and able to share our things, whatever weird things, wet shaving in this case, <laughs> but like there's still a long way to go, but I'm really encouraged like, in my lifetime. I'm, I'm and, and for set, setting up for the future generation, my children's generation, they can see people. I mean, I, 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 I spoke about this before, like the fact that the Marvel movie Shang-Chi stars a, a Asian American Can Canadian what I'll take it whatever uh, like it's hu it's huge it's huge I did not see any other movie at that time in the theater I went to go that, to that one to support it 
and it, it's you know that's that's a superhero that you can see on the screen. It's it's someone that looks like me, that looks like my family. So um, that, in a very long-winded way, is kind of what voices means to me. It's like, like, do, do I want to follow <laughs> up with that? Uh, you know. Sorry. Um, so yeah, like, yeah, same kind of the same thing. Obviously, the you know the alluding to you know the podcast um, voices you know can have multiple differences. You know, as um as a uh, first generation or technically second generation um, Asian American, you know, my parents immigrated here from the Philippines. Um, a lot of times, you know, in Asian culture, you kind of have that authoritative, you know, like households. I don't, I can't speak for everyone, but it's a common stereotype, right? <clears throat> you know, like um, that Asian parents can be, <clears throat> excuse me, like very, yeah, just um, very kind of overbearing, very judgmental, things like that. And growing up with that, sometimes you don't feel like you have a voice to like maybe speak your mind, you know, like you can, you know, like you're taught in, like in schools, like yeah, America, you know, freedom of speech, you know, and everything like that. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. And sometimes, um, I know many times like for myself, um, yeah, I didn't feel like I'd al I could always just talk about anything that was on my mind, you know, just in, in fear, uh, really, you know, like, of uh, uh of, of my parents and my parents aren't you know they, they're great parents you know i think a lot of that was could also be uh, attributed to just you know um you know myself but i know for many people for for many asians growing up um here that that's that's a common thing like that their voices aren't heard and then uh, um and yeah um to uh kind of talk about you know the same thing you know like with you, John, and talking about Shang Chi, was for me, um, at least in my adulthood, the movie for me was Crazy Rich Asians, like oh, yes. a full ensemble cast of um, uh, Asians from from everywhere, you know, and uh, and you're just like, oh wow, we could have like an ensemble cast, a comedy drama rom com or rom com, and, and things like that, and and that doesn't mean you have to be, you know. Uh, of Asian descent to like understand a lot of those things, you know, uh, like sometimes, you know, just comedy is comedy, but it's just, uh, it's nice to kind of see something where, you know, outside of, don't get me wrong, love Bruce Lee, love Jackie Chan. But, um, you know, other than that, I, I always think about like Asians are usually were depicted as yeah. like the villain, sure, like in a certain thing. It's just like, oh, it's Yakuza. Oh, it's triads. Oh, it's like a, you know, in, and things like that um and yeah or but but yeah I, I think definitely you know um here we are in in 2022 um just seeing more not just representation but also just exposure mm. in general for um you know for for various for various ethnicities and uh, yeah um i was gonna write this up you know and things like that and i haven't i, I told you guys but kind of in with the connection, uh, John, that you said uh, to stop a mm -hmm. AAPI hate, is that um, just for me early in the, it was probably a few months into the pandemic, you know, like, I don't think there was any vaccines or anything. So it's probably like the summer of 2020. Um, you know, there was a lot of hostility, like in the media, just out there, I, you could say socially and politically. Um, and stuff like that, um, you know, people um, just, you know, whether it was tagging it as like the China virus or um, the Kung flu, we, you know, we've heard all of the, the derogatory like slurs and terms for it. Um, but yeah, I was at a gas station just putting in gas and someone, you know, decided that it was on them just to kind of like you know, voice their gripes, their voices, but right, in an opposite right. way, you know, uh, and saying that, you know, like all of this, you know, it, it's because of like my people, you know, and I'm just like, Hey, Hey there, buddy, you know, just, uh, I'm glad that you feel that, you know, you just have the leeway just to just openly shout this out. But, uh, yeah, there's, I think I, I've, I've never felt like uncomfortable like that, 
you know? And it was nothing. It was just an incident. It was nothing, you know, like I kind of just, you know, brushed the guy off and, and, and left. But I didn't grow up with like any overt like racism, you know, uh, growing up, like, you know, like very like, like diverse upbringing, um, you know, uh, joke, you know, joking here and there, but never like, like that kind of ugly yeah. vitriol that you would, you know, kind of come to expect. And that's what it was. It was like, it was just a really ugly moment. And so I think, you know, with us, um, you know, with a certain um, uh, amount of the proceeds, you know, uh, going to stop AAPI hate, um, that's not necessarily saying that you're going to stop racism. I mean, that's, that's obviously impossible, but, you know, um, I mean, I would see the, the headlines, you know, like, you know, um, elderly Asian person, you know, attacked, uh, and it didn't matter. It didn't matter if it was New York. It didn't matter if it was a small town in Minnesota. It didn't matter if it was here, you know, in, in Southern California, that people just felt, um, you know, they felt like they had authority just to, you know, attack like someone, you know, just because of, of their race or, or whatever. And so I know that, um, if you're, if you're not aware that, you know, besides trying to like, you know, be a good voice in the community, um, for all Asian American Pacific Islanders, um, but, you know, for, for people like, yeah, like who, who get attacked and, and stuff like that, you know, I think, uh, I think, you know, they, they try to help those people as well in, in, in the smaller cases, but, but yeah, um, I'm just super, you know, glad I'm super humbled, you know, uh, with this, you know, it's been just a, uh, kind of a pleasure just to chat with you guys about, about this, you know, um, and regardless of, uh, you know, how, how it goes, I think it'll be, I, I think it'll be received well. I think a lot of people are, are, are really going to enjoy it. Um, you know, and, and I hope people enjoy it. But yeah, I just think, you know, being able to put the spotlight on it, you know, um, on the, the issue at hand is also important going forward. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that too, Gerard. I know that, you know, I'll, I'll, with Gerard's story, I'll, and I'll tell you here now that, um, you know, this organization came together at this time for a reason. And it was because there's something inherent in the Asian culture, uh, especially for immigrants and, you know, uh, George, George's parents immigrated from the Philippines. My parents immigrated from Taiwan, and in general, the 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 operating mode is to keep your head low, uh, keep keep your head down. Don't draw attention to yourself. If someone throw uh, if someone throws a you know racial slur at you, you're gonna wind up in trouble somehow. Like be more in trouble, even though you're the one being insulted, being attacked. And uh, you know, part of st- Stop AAPI Hate is to share these stories so that people know, hey, this, this is happening. It's still happening. Like record numbers of violence, violence against elderly Asians, you know, like just people who can't defend themselves. And uh, some of the resources that Stop AAPI uh, Hate has provided, I know, are like escorts, like because this was happening in major cities, the, the Bay Area, in in New York, so uh, there's other resources too. If you need like legal, you know, legal help, legal representation. So when you guys, when listeners, do you have the time to check out what they're doing? If you're just curious, why you know why are we uh, bringing light to this organization, this issue? Go visit stopaapi.org. Uh, you can see w- the good work that they're doing. Um, but before I forget to, I also did want to hear from Ben. And, um, what this, you know, what this name that we came up with, Voices, uh, what that means to you. Yeah, sure. You know, and I, and I think um, being able to hear your stories is really just the perfect example of what this release is about. Um, it's called Voices, which means, you know, we want, we want to be able to give everybody a voice. And so being able to hear what your guys' experiences have been like, um, you know, I hope it's something that folks can really kind of resonate with and identify with together as fellow human beings. Um, I think, you know, as a white guy, obviously, um, you know, sometimes people think, well, 
there's not really much that I have to contribute to a conversation about race. You know, and typically white people are, well, you know, why are people attacking me just for, you know, my race? And now you're the one that's being racist against me or whatever it might be. Um, and really, the, what I, the way that I look at it is you could either look at it as a competition where someone's trying to win and you don't want to lose, you know. <laughs> so if, if another race is winning, then that means that I lose something, whatever. Or you could look at it as a way of, you know, celebration. You know, and that diversity and understanding other perspectives actually broadens your perspective of the world and helps you understand humanity in a deeper way. And I think that that's what, you know, not that we're going to solve racism with a soap release, you know, <laughs> right. but we certainly want you guys to be able to, to share your stories. And that's the way <laughs> it's, it's <awesome>. possible. <laughs> I mean, there's a I quote that I've, I heard, um, and it always kind of comes back to me when, when we start talking about stuff like this, which is that people are hard to hate up close. Um, and obviously, we've been in a time over the last four or five years in this country where, like, it seems like just sort of accelerating towards just oblivion, you know, just people like talking about going to war, brother against brother and like civil war and stuff. Um, and and incidents of racism just through the roof, you know, people just feeling emboldened to say, well, you know, really what it is is fear, their fear of losing whatever they have or, or whatever it might be. So there's not a posture of listening to other people's voices. It's more of, um, let's fight. You know, you're, you're coming for what I have, and i got to defend it. Um, and so there's definitely not listening, and there's not celebrating. But I think all of us want to be heard in some way or another, and we want people to listen to our stories and see things from our perspectives. Um, and so if we want to be heard, well, then we also have to be able to listen um, and celebrate. And, you know, for me... Um, the most powerful association um, is that, you know, I'm married to an immigrant from, from Malaysia. My wife is Chinese from Malaysia. And so our son is growing up as an Asian American. <laughs> Elaine is waving. She's waving. Yeah, she's waving for those. That... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it's interesting because, you know, obviously um, Elaine you know, our family is here in New York and in, in America. And so we're really glad that we, we have access to a lot of um, Asian culture here. Uh, but also being so far away from home, you know, you would think that that would be something that people could understand. Um, but, you know, immigrants typically get a lot of hate and, and distrust in this country. Um, meanwhile, you know, my son is just a little guy. He's just five years old, you know. <laughs> He's going to school and he's learning his learning how to write and, and learning how to make friends just like every other little five year old boy. Um, he he happens to be bilingual and he eats trilingual. also trilingual, yeah, trilingual. Ooh. He he eats all different types of food and he you know, it's it's something that we believe makes um, his life richer mm -hmm. and I want him to be able to celebrate that stuff and not have to hide it. And, and not have to try to be more American or more white or whatever it might be and emphasize that side of him. Um, so for me, being able to work together with you guys on this and listen to your stories, it helps me identify more with his experience and helps me to be a better father, you know? And so I appreciate just the opportunity to hear from you guys. And, you know, I've heard, I've heard the stories from my wife too, and I've heard, we've heard from our friends and, um, you know, I won't, repeat too much you know i want you guys to really have the spotlight here um but it's real the stuff that you guys are talking about it's not just news stories um any immigrant any asian that that you speak to has a story like the ones that you guys have have shared um from the, the past couple of years and there's a, a long history in this country of, of asian exclusion and um exoticization and you know, you can look up things like the thousand mile rule, salesmen traveling overseas, uh, it just doesn't count, you know, where they looked at Asian women as being kind of um, less than human. Um, you can look up the Chinese Exclusion Act, you can look up immigration policy, a lot of immigration policy specifically was written um, with Asians in mind, Asian immigrants in mind. 
Um, we don't really talk about a lot of that stuff in this country, but that stuff has an impact. Um, and, you know, we live in an area where there's a lot more Asians. Um, you know, Gerard, you also live in an, an area with a healthy Asian population. I think you too, John, right? I think so. There's a good amount yeah. of Asian matter. Um, but there's a lot of places where, you know, there isn't any Asian people or Asian culture. And so it can feel really different and really um, unique. So the best thing I think that we can do is be able to give you guys a way that you can share your stories and hopefully people will listen. I kind of, one thing kind of st standing out at when you mentioned uh, just being a father and with your son about experiencing all, you know, all uh, both sides of the family with food. And I, 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 I feel like that's kind of where we can, maybe we can um, bring this home is talking about, <laughs> talking about food. Because I know <laughs> we all love food. We all love to cook. We're f Dude, we'll be oh, hey, here said, forever. This is, this is to bring it home, okay? To bring it home. <laughs> but... <laughs> You're bringing it home, meaning you're wrapping it up by opening well, up. It's the last. Food. It's the last. Yeah, I'm, I'm opening up a can of worms, but it's a. Uh, I, I know it's a topic we can all talk to at length, but maybe, you know, in the con in the context of what we're doing here, it's experiencing other cultures through their food. And I know just when I travel, I haven't traveled since having little kids uh, internationally, but hopefully that'll pick up again uh, since they're being more independent. But that's, that's one way I love, it's not necessarily to see all the monuments and what, it, that kind of stuff is really important too. But I feel like, I, I know for me to eat the native cuisine and experience what that is, what are the particular spices, combinations, flavors of it um, is, is how I like to experience that. And um, I, I hope, you know, with the, Again, mango sticky rice is the kind of the inspiration, but that's that's not all it is. Um, for those who might not be able to, uh, you, you know, although I think most places in the U.S. have a Chinese restaurant, and even if it's Americanized Chinese food, and in case those who don't know, American Americanized Chinese food, it's its own thing, and it's great, but that's not what they're. You know, it, it's not what like. China people in China are, are eating and even then there's all different cuisines in China I'm see I'm okay I'm going off on already on a tangent <laughs> <laughs> dang it but uh, uh you tried <laughs> my point my point is that like there's some there's some way that you have come across some form of Chinese culture or uh, Asian culture and um I don't know I, I think for for one one hope here is that uh even if you don't know what mango sticky rice is when you get this, it's still something that actually might inspire you, inspire you to go seek it out or some other dish that we talk about on today's episode. You know, uh, I, I think that that food is, is a great way to kind of uh, break through barriers. That's I probably should just stuck with that. But yes, breakthrough barriers, food. I want to add one more point because I was in Paris two days ago two days ago and I was opening the menu and it has frog legs and snail and all that stuff and I was thinking and my coworker was like oh yeah you know Parisian are like you know snobbish with their food all the gourmet food and stuff and I was like as a Chinese person I grew up eating like frog leg kanji and snails and stuff like that but then the connotation of Chinese food is like ew Chinese are dirty they eat everything but then the French people eat the same thing and ooh French people are like classy they eat all these you know things so it's it's like a double standard there mm -hmm. totally this is the funny thing about that, you know, like, I, I always wondered, like, I'm like, people have no problem eating clams and oysters and mussels, which are also in shells, but all of a sudden, a snail, just because it, you know, it slugs around on land and not the ocean, now all of a sudden, there's this big old hoopla with it. And so, you know, because I'm going to tell you right now, when I go to dim sum, I very much like snails. And when I go, if I go to a French place, you better put the garlic and all the herbs <laughs> and the butter in that escar. It better be drowning yeah. in butter because it's delicious yeah. on both ends. <laughs> so, 
So, you know, you talk about like, you, you had mentioned like American Chinese food, you know, and then there's definitely like Filipino dishes, which were adopted kind of bastardized as well for the, for a Filipino palate, but also for kind of like a desperate palate. One of mm. them is spaghetti, right? <laughs> Piss off all of the Italians. I'm sorry, Ben. <laughs> okay. Like, like, you know, like Filipino spaghetti is, is a thing. And if you don't know, well, here you go. You know, uh, I think the, the general idea is that during wartime, you know, like you had like, you know, GIs, like, you know, fighting and a lot of them wanted like some comfort food, like from home, like spaghetti, but stuff like meat was expensive. It wasn't readily available. Um, even like, like tomatoes don't really grow in the Philippines, you know, like we're not known for our tomato production. So what do you do? You kind of, you have to improvise, you know? So you might have some tomato sauce, but you might put other red things that resemble tomatoes in it, like ketchup, right? If you don't have like, you know, ground beef and herbs, you're just going to use canned beef or processed mm -hmm. like pr meat products, like hot dogs, right? Oh, we don't have like Parmesan, you know, like over there. We have like canned melty craft cheese that's really processed and, and in its own normal way, it's awful, but you kind of put it together and you have this like really sentimental mm. like dish for a lot of Filipinos. It doesn't taste like at all like Italian spaghetti. It, it's it's very sweet, you know, like like I said, like they, maybe they didn't have salt. Maybe they just want to, you know, add sugar or, or, or something else. And but it's just kind of like one of those things that kind of shows that food does cross barriers, you know, like crosses over, um, you know, and it's just kind of like interesting to see. Um, another one that like kind of also comes to mind is uh, I'm not Korean, but um, I really enjoy the the Korean dish, uh, bude jjigae. It's known as like army based stew. And it incorporates like various, you know, like um, you can incorporate um, the Korean chili paste, gokujang, like some vegetables, things like that. But what else does it have? It has spam and American cheese and ramen mm. from a package, <laughs> you know? And it's just, uh, yeah, food is one of those things that uh, I definitely, you know, I always like, when I, whenever I visit a place, it's kind of like one of my rules I set for myself is that one, <clears throat> don't eat anything that you can get better at home. And then the second rule is find whatever, wherever you're visiting, find what that place does best, right? So, and I think if we, if we looked at that, you know, I think Ben said, uh, you know, like it, it would, it would definitely like, you know, build more bridges than, than mm. break. Well put, well put. And I'll throw it over to Ben. Ben, I feel like there's a couple of different ways to go because I feel like in the creation of the scent, which you shared a lot today, that's, it's like cooking, right? There's a lot of trial and error, it seems like. Uh, and you talked a little bit about, you know, find h how do you put together the right ingredients to trick our noses to think, oh, that's mango. Oh, you know, oh, that's mm -hmm. coconut. Um, do, do you think your, I guess, your interest in cooking uh, kind of really helps out in, in, in the scent creation part of things? Oh, definitely, 100%. Um, you know, yeah, when you're cooking food, you start off by following recipes and kind of learning from other people. So you, maybe if you've got somebody that in your house that knows how to cook, you can cook with them and watch. Or um, for me, I, I watched a lot of you know Food Network and YouTube and that kind of thing. So that was how I learned when I was younger. But I also did a lot of experimentation, uh, very different from, say, baking, where things need to be really precise, you know, with with cooking, you can just kind of taste as you go along and evaluate and add. And a lot of what you're doing is paying attention. Um, so tasting something and then thinking and processing and imagining you know, what, what am I, what am I tasting right now? What am I smelling right now? What's missing? What would, what seems to be out of balance or out of whack? Um, and so for fragrance creation, I kind of approached it the same way. You know, there's not a whole lot of resources out there, uh, you know, quote unquote recipes. <laughs> There's not a mm. lot of that. There's some basic stuff out there. Right. Um, and so, so starting to kind of learn the materials is really just a matter of putting together very simple, basic accords and trying to figure out how materials function. Um, but they do different things in combination and they do different things even at dilution. The same material 
at a 1% dilution will smell different at a 10% dilution. And then it'll smell different on a strip versus on skin. And then certainly it's a wild card when you start throwing it in things like soap. Um, so it's definitely uh, a process of experimentation. And there's a lot of risk and you have to be willing to put some money on the line too and time into it. Mm. Um, you know, and I really, you know, I, I do think that cooking is something that, you know, we can all kind of identify with together and, you know, George just hearing, you know, some of the, the soldiers do that kind of thing, like leftover army rations, you know, a country that's post-war, mm -hmm. uh, very poor, and you put together whatever you can. Um, it reminds me a lot of this sort of immigrant meals, you know, and I, my, my parents, uh, you know, I'm from, I'm from New York and my parents are uh, Italian. And so they would tell me the stories of, of my immigrant ancestors, you know, great grandmother and, and whatever, and the food that they would make. And they were trying so hard to keep their heads down, just like you said, uh, to blend in and um, be as American as possible, you know, but meanwhile, all they knew was Italian food, you know, and so they were, they were cooking all their stuff and that was just what they knew and they thought they were doing their best at being american but they were really being super italian <laughs> um so you know it's interesting how quickly we forget you know what that experience is like and i think saying connected to the stories the recipes the culture that that we identify with can help us to understand how important those stories and that culture can be for other people um to the point where, you know, we try to look for similarities and commonalities, um, not in a way to erase our differences, but look for similarities in a way of understanding the humanity of somebody else. We all care about our families. We all care about the things that are important to us, um, our homes, the people that we're with, and of course the food that reminds us of, of people that we cared about, that we ate that food together with, you know, when we were kids or, or you know, whatever it might be. Um, and so, you know, I, I really think cooking and, and fragrance and all of the stuff that we've been talking about in, in this episode really just kind of overlaps just the ways that we can connect with other people. I think we're just scratching the surface on something that's very near and dear. And I, I feel like hopefully we can keep the conversation, go conversation going in, in addition to talking about shaving stuff and this hobby that we love. So I, I want to thank you both uh, for kind of putting, you know, get, getting things going uh, along with that. But uh, I'm sure listeners, you're wondering the actual logistics <laughs> and the nitty gritty details. So with Ben's help, um, we, we will we'll, we'll share, with that, share that with you right now. So you're looking at Saturday, August 13th as the drop date. Ben, where can people find voices? Uh, so on Saturday, August uh, 13th at 10 a.m. Eastern, you'll be able to find it at houseofmammoth.com. Um, it, Voices is going to be released in our Tusk shaving soap, and then there's going to be two options for aftershaves. There's our Balm and Splash, both were formulated by Vita of Chicago Blooming Company. Fantastic products. And then you're also going to be able to buy the 48 mil uh, EDP. Uh, if you want to complete the, the trifecta or the quadfecta, go for it. <laughs> um, we'll also give you guys a little bit of a teaser uh, later in the, in the week. We're going to be announcing um, some really cool voices brushes. I think there's just four of them uh, with the Mammoth Coin and their collaborations between um, us and uh, uh, Rob from Chisel and Hound. Uh, with the Mammoth Coin, and he actually did something really cool, kind of like a nod to the scent. He made these brushes partially out of mango wood, um, and they're really, really beautiful. So if you like a kind of classic, traditional-looking um, uh, brush, uh, the mango wood looks awesome, and then they have kind of like a black, pearly top. And the mammoth coin, which is sort of like an antique uh, bronze or brass look, and then they're going to be fitted with a 26-millimeter um I think the new knot actually. I forget what from, is from it sixteen? Yeah, is, is, is there a V sixteen or V sixteen? The brand new one, uh, sixteen. So if, if you haven't tried V sixteen, uh, Venturian, it's going to be a chance to grab one of those. So um, as John and, and Gerard mentioned earlier, voices is also um, something not only where we're we're highlighting you know this theme in particular, but we're also going to be putting some real you know, I guess 
feet to the ground, <laughs> whatever the word is. So we're, we're donating a dollar from every soap sold uh, to um, stop AAPI hate. And then we're also going to be donating 10% of each brush and each uh, EDP. And so feel free, you know, go nuts, buy everything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a limited edition, but we've, we tried to make a good amount so that everyone will be able to get it. Um, so it's going to be released first at our, at our site. And then uh, you'll see a few of our, our retailers internationally will also be able to get it too. So um, right now, we've definitely confirmed that it's going to be at Anti Katura in, in the uh, EU, um, in Slovenia. And then it's also going to be at top of the chain up in Canada. Uh, right now, I'm working on a few uh, additional international vendors, uh, but none confirmed at the moment. But definitely follow um, uh, House of Mammoth and Lather Talk for more information uh, about this release, and you'll definitely be able to, you'll know where, where you can pick this stuff up. Awesome. Thanks, Ben, for sharing uh, all those details. And guys, I, hopefully, I mean, maybe after the release, we can give, get back and do this again, uh, maybe as a live show. Um, that's kind of in the back of my head. If, if after we, in general, I think people are pretty excited about it. Uh, granted, it's like skewed from people on the Lather Talk Discord <laughs> and it's people reaching out to me. But in, in general, I've been really encouraged uh, by, by the I I initial feedback uh, from the our fellow hobbyists. Right, and and I've definitely been seeing a lot of interest from vendors too. Um, they only reach out to me when they hear from their customers. And so customers are talking to the vendors about it. And so mm. if that's something that you're interested in, talk to, talk to the vendors and, you know, they can set something up for me. Awesome. Well, that, that's, I think that's a good thing to know in general. Uh, I, I know, uh, yeah, actually right away people were wondering, it's available in country X. And uh, I, I had to reach back out to Ben because it's, <laughs> he, uh, I, Something I, I actually did not mention is just how much help Ben has been in addition to creating the scent and all of that is the logistics of putting together donations and, and you know, how, how to do how to do this right. So I definitely can't, you know, before before ending the show, I have to thank you, Ben, for just going above and beyond, you know, a um, collabor collaborator, partner, um, just really, really lucky to have you on board this project. Yeah, thank you guys so much, you know, and, and really, I, I want to throw it right back to you guys, because you very easily could have made this a vanity project of like, sort of, look at us, we have a podcast, we have a soap, you know, <laughs> which, you know, plenty of people have done before. And it's just like, yet another, like you said, yet another vanity project, but just with somebody else's face on it. Um, and you guys very pointedly from the beginning, were like, we're not doing that. We want this to be meaningful because of this and that. And it's something that I think ended up being very special and very personal for all of us. Um, I couldn't think of a better project to be able to work on. So thank you guys for including me. I feel all warm and fuzzy right now. <laughs> <laughs> Look, why are we doing this otherwise? It's the heat. Oh, yeah. Monday it's the heat and humidity. It's exhaustion. <laughs> why are we doing this if it's not meaningful? You yeah. Know? <laughs> The, the next collaboration, there's this fragrance. It's called a Ventus. No, I don't know if you've heard of it. do tell, do tell. <laughs> I mean, Ventus ben, died. <laughs> we'll force Ben to make a, a, Ventus. a Ventus dupe. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's a wrap for this episode. Gerard, Ben pleasure talking with you tonight guys we are super psyched for the release of voices if you have any questions at all reach out to us uh on our socials i'll include that in the show notes and in the little bumper afterwards but uh, we'll see you all again next episode and maybe have some feedback on voices and we hear from you guys so take care gerard ben have a good night